And I'm uh, quick. I'm like a rabbit. <laughs> so, but like, dude, I shot that elk. I was happy as a pig in poo. Like, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. First day, the sun's not even up. But as Robbie Denning says, if you shoot enough, eventually something's going to be big. And Robbie's right. Like, <laughs> we beat ourselves up for 12 days. And I'm like, that was the funnest hunt of my life. And they're like, you're sick and twisted. And I'm like, my, that is what it's all about for me. So why, I don't know, but it definitely, that's what trips my trigger is hunts like that. Hello. All right. You're listening to the Gritty Bowman, home of Gritty Bow Hunting Films, interviews, tall tales, and a wee bit of manly boasting. I'm South Cox, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jules McQueen. And I'm Jana Waller. And we want to... To stay gritty. <laughs> <laughs> what was that you just stuffed in your mouth? <laughs> Emergency. I just slam it. Mm. It Which tastes like shit, so I might as well get it over with early really and quick. <laughs> uh, all right, I folks. do the same thing with... <clears throat> Pre-workout. Yeah. I just throw a scoop full in and down with water. That's what I've got. Okay, here we go. Ready? No. I, <laughs> <coughs> I panicked. I think some of that powder went in my nose. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, folks. Welcome to the Greedy Bowman Podcast. I'm here with Aaron Snyder today uh, on this lovely morning. Is it sunny where you're at? It is sunny. Well, it's kind of cloudy. It's nice. It's supposed to snow tomorrow. Going to go nice. on an epic shed hunting trip if it doesn't have another blizzard. Dude, that hat you're wearing, that it's monumental. It's Yeah, it's, I'm, I'll drop the mic, walk away. That, yeah. Dude, it's, it's awesome. It's a funny story with the hat. I thought this chick was an anti-hunter on my Instagram page. So I got all defensive, and I looked, and she's from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And obviously, there is no anti-hunters if you're into the UP. They don't exist up there, and they're like unicorns. And uh, so I ordered some hats for me and all my friends, and I posted last night. Somebody said I should do the podcast with the hat on, and so here it is. It's it's a it, – what do you call that, like a toque? And, I think and, that's what Jody would call it or any Canadian. I call it my hat with ears. It, <laughs> it is my own version of be the decoy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has, it has those bare ears. You got me a hat, right? I did. I got. I ordered six or eight of them. Frank took his last night, and Colton took his. So I just. I also. I reordered because she sent an extra beanie in there with yeah. no ears and no just a pullover beanie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, it looks yeah super comfortable. And the tags that cover the ears and then the tassels, dude. It's money. I wish I I had that to wear this weekend because you can tie that out of the way if you want. You can be down. I, I like them down. It's versatile. It's. I don't think I'll shoot the recurve because I'll hit this with the string and mm, poke an eye out. That could be bad. It's actually kind of hot. I only wore it to be funny. I'm gonna have to take it off soon because it's it is kind of warm. Um. I um. Uh, we're getting a little start, a late start this morning. That wasn't really your fault this time, though. Oh, I got some hat here. Look at that, people. <laughs> I have hair now. <laughs> Ugh. I kind of am jealous. I kind of wish I had hair. Yeah, it happens. So, today, we are going to talk about stoves. Yeah, backpacking stoves, different options. And Aaron has some opinions on the stoves. So, we'll get Aaron's uh, unfiltered opinion. And um, yeah. and then you know, probably piss some people off too. Yeah, because I don't like jet boils. Mm-hmm. We'll get into it. We'll get into it. Uh, but before we do that, we got to give away a backpack. We do the Apollo, the, <laughs> the new uh, Kafaru Apollo pack. You have that. We talked about it last week on the last uh, uh, episode we did, and you've got a prototype that is. Uh, for oh, hold on, you picked a name. We we drew it a was name. Luke Johnson. That's but right, the Luke Johnson. <laughs> yep, that's right. It's Luke Johnson, but not 
Our friend Should Luke I Johnson. Tell people how I knew immediately it was not the Luke Johnson. Why not? Because it had a dead animal for the guy's profile picture <laughs> and a big one. So I knew immediately it was not Luke. Now, hang on. I have seen Luke shot a cougar with his recurve. Yes. I've, he's killed an animal. He's killed two, <laughs> three. Well, he killed a bear. He probably what killed an it? elk, but he, he, did, he didn't find it. <laughs> you know, that reminds me of a story, a funny story, which is real quick, not to see squirrels. I was hunting with the guy, and you know, we called in an elk. He shot. Anyway, we got up to it, and he's just doing cheetah flips. He's you know all jacked up on Mountain Dew, just happy. I'm like dude, is this the first elk you've ever killed? He's like, oh, hell no. It's the first one I've ever found, though. <laughs> that's, that's Luke. That's <laughs> not good. The, the guy, he was telling me, he, um, he, he, he exaggerated a little bit, but he had um, probably missed, hit one on the leg, missed several. He said he gets a little too excited, so that day he was pretty amped. 14 years of elk hunting, he finally got one. So Luke has... Um, Trying real hard. If I, I'm going to North Idaho this year, if I get up there and get it done, we're going to give Luke a hand. Yep. Cool. So this new Luke Johnson, I'm going to send him a PM, tell him he won the Apollo backpack. And by the way, you can get that backpack at Kafaru for 15% off. How much does the pack cost? 160 I think. 160 I think it's like 140 something with the code cool i can't say i've actually bought one i don't have to <laughs> kind of nice so it is a cool pack though we sold a bunch of them everybody's liked them that's got them so far we're shipping them quick though you get them usually in like a week that's awesome that's awesome we got um we got our film up on our website now from the full draw from last year's full draw our film it's not about the horns so it's up there. You can go download it. All the special features were added. There's a bunch of bonus footage. and uh, Go out there and download our film and help support the podcast. It's a good movie. Right, Aaron? Yes, it is. I've watched it twice. Um, and then uh, your T-shirt, When There's Carbon In There, There's Hope. I've almost got it done. Well, so that's, <laughs> that's going to be cool. I've had a bunch of people ask me about that. Yeah, it, I don't. I don't think people realize I have really no part of that other than coming up with oh, no. that one-liner. <laughs> In fact, it was really people asked for it. I don't really have the money to buy the T-shirts, but <laughs> <laughs> it seems like there's a, a, a demand. So that's cool. Okay, so all that's taken. Do we have anything else we need to talk about? I, I wanted to go over. Just Gritty Bowman fans have been super cool and go over, if you're cool with it, a couple of new packs, kind of release them. Just take a second that we're coming out with in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so we'll go over. This is the – am I good there? Yep. This is the 14 or This is basically the new version of uh, our old Spike Camp. It's relatively small. I haven't cubed it yet. Call it a 14er. This is about the size of a pack you'd want to climb a 14er with, day pack. Um, pretty sleek. It's got two compression straps. You've got a place to put a grab it. Um, it's got a center zipper. Well, these buckles, the reason why we did this webbing here is so when you unbuckle this compression strap, they don't just fly out. They stay right in place. Nice. Full center zip all the way down. It's also top access. I've got a stuff full of sleeping bags or something. And, oh, get in there. It's also got the lid up top. Oh, cool. Yeah, so you can put stuff in there. It's got a, I'm not showing yet the new suspension. We torqued the, we as in Eric Bender <laughs> did most of this. He torqued the um, original suspension. We changed the foam to a softer foam in the back pad. Well, we changed the uh, torso pad up a little bit, basically to more comfortable for climbing. It pivots with the body a little bit. Uh, the frame is a little taller than the old Spike Camp. This is 23 inches, so you can get a little bit more load hauling out of it or ability. Um, so this is the 14er. I don't have an idea on price point yet because I wasn't even supposed to talk about it, but I wanted to, so I, we are. Uh, this one's an Eric Bender 
cool thing about Eric Bender is um, I don't I pretty much just kind of say, hey, I kind of want this. And then I don't see him for like a week. And he comes back with like six versions of something. And I get to pick from one. <laughs> he, uh, so it, it, it's a very good dynamic between he and I. He, um, I'm kind of his boss. I am his boss, but I'm not really his boss because he doesn't really need one as far as that goes. He, um, he's a very, very, very good designer. He comes out with a lot of uh, cool ideas. He does what we call benderize things. And then I Snyderize things. I way oversimplify them, and he overcomplicates them. And then we meet in the middle. It works out great. <laughs> so this one, the old Spike Camp swedged a little bit at the bottom, yep. and the top entry was a little too small. So we made the bottom a little smaller on the 14er and the top a little bit bigger. And then obviously full zip access. This is kind of cool. I like this. It's a handle. Um, a lot of times you lay your pack down. If I'm glassing and I need something, I'm reaching for whatever. So it's got a full handle down here, and it's also got the full handle on this side here, too, up the top. So the next one, which this may be my favorite day pack ever in the world. Favoritist? Exactly. <laughs> That's a Detroit Lake, Oregon word. <laughs> um, so what this – we needed to come up with a new late-season pack. Our old late-season had been in line forever. Um and this is it. It's the Terry All. The Terry All Mountain Range is a place Patrick frequents. It's where the rendezvous for Kafaru is for the spring rendezvous. Um, so it's a panel loader. So you can dump the whole thing open from here. It's also got the top load and it's got the pocket up here. Just like the um, 14er. How many cubic inches is that pack? 3,200. So somebody like Kenton Carruth from First Light could do 14 days in this. I myself stretch it for a day pack. Um, <laughs> he, he, he was doing three days with a spike camp. I can't fit my camera in a spike camp. Um, but what does that do to eat? I mean, is it just? I think nothing. He just he just fasts. I guess. I know. It's not good. So <laughs> this, you've got a daisy chain for this basically mm -hmm. top flap. What the idea is here, this expands out this pocket. Yep. What's cool about this is that holds 15 power binoculars, 20 powers, a DSLR camera with a 24 to 70 lens. There's a sleeve right here. This sleeve is where I put my, my, my butt pad, my pad for when I sit down. You can also, sometimes I'll put my, excuse me, some of my optics kit in there, whether it be like the vertical post or lens cleaner or whatever. Um, gloves that goes in there and then you can put your spotting scope in this pocket your tripod in this pocket this will also fit inside of it a uh, extra large uh, f-stop pod it's what holds camera gear will fit inside of this as well and then again this thing's stuffed with whoobies and anyway we dump those out of there it's pretty big inside, water bladder pocket, and then you've got two zippered pockets on this panel here. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool pack. I'm excited about it. I've been running it for like three months, several renditions of it. It's got the same new cool kind of suspension, the way this torso pad and lumbar pad work with each other. It attaches differently. We built this to pivot some with you for climbing and maneuverability. It's not a load hauling pack, 50 pounds or ish, six. I mean, it'll haul whatever you want it to, but comfort wise, there's some photos I have of giant sheds. They were strapped to this thing on the one. We had like six or eight big ones. Um, so, yeah, this is going to be out in a couple weeks. We're, I'm specifically excited about this because it holds so much optics. And so, grab it, and it's got my camera, and my 15s, my spotter, the whole nine yards, and my day hunting stuff. Arizona guys would like this, especially running those big glass for coos deer and stuff. Um, it's a very optics and camera gear happy pack. Nice. That's so that's all I have to say about that. Um, oh, I do have one thing because I got a ton of emails about it. This hat I wear all the time, Otis. Mm -hmm. So Otis, it's a cleaning. They make cleaning kits. They make a bunch of stuff, but they make cleaning kits for the military for guns. And uh, – I'm friends with the Otis rep, and I like this hat, so I stole it from him, and uh, then he dropped. I'll just show you. Look at him. Just look at it. 
look how many of those hats he gave me. So now I can get them all funky and just keep rotating them out. But Otis <laughs> makes great cleaning kits for um, they, in the military. We used them. They were all pretty awesome. So Sweet. Anyway, so are we ready for stoves? Yeah. So we're going to talk about stoves and we're going to talk about we, – we, we've been getting a ton of emails. In fact, I took like a poll of the last like uh, 60 emails we've had. Oh, dang. And just what are, what are people asking in those emails? Um, and that's just in the last few, you know, week or so. And those emails basically were, um, it was fitness was like more than half. Um, some backcountry food, what people eat in the backcountry. Um, and uh, and uh, some more, you know, more questions about coming out west. Mm-hmm. Uh, questions about um, uh, uh, what's the latest gear that uh, f- you know from anywhere from trekking poles, which has become a, a, a you get, getting a ton of questions about trekking poles. So we kind of we'll we'll get around to uh, some more of that stuff because that's what people are asking asking us about. But today we're going to get into the stoves, talk about those, and then talk about backcountry food. And uh, I wrote it down. We, we, we talked about backcountry food last year in episode 11, 200 days in the backcountry. <laughs> and and uh, so if you didn't catch that, go back and check. You'll hear all about butthole sandwiches and other things and, and foods that, uh, that Aaron and I take in the backcountry. But we're going to update that, uh, go over that a little bit today after we talk about the stoves. So, so hang out for that, and we'll we'll get into we'll get into some of this what we take in the backcountry for food. But with that, Aaron, take it away. Stoves, tell me about stoves. All right, so stoves. So I'm going to go through um, all the different not not specific models, but potential options of of types of stoves. Um, First, you have the the old school multi fuel stove. That's a stove that takes a separate bottle or container. Uh, you know, you attach it to it. White gas is predominantly what most people use, but it'll take diesel, gasoline, kerosene, white gas. Takes anything. Um, that is one kind of option that, uh, and I'll go over the models later on of what I prefer in, in each type of stove. Uh, the downside to a multi fuel stove. Uh, heavy they're they're generally heavier well they are not generally always are heavier and uh takes up a little more space obviously you got a couple different components to it uh generally messier you're going to get white gas pissing all over you no matter how hard you try when you detach the hose from either the canister or the stove uh it's not a canister the bottle the fuel bottle now out of all the stoves, I think I brought seven today. My multi-fuel stove is at this point on top of a mountain in Colorado. I let my buddy borrow it. It's a Primus Omni Light tie. It's titanium. But great stove. You can you travel. You travel with an empty fuel bottle. They don't have white gas somewhere. You switch out the little jet, the pisser, to a diesel fuel, and you pump it up at the gas station and fill her up with diesel. It's When the zombies come, you want probably a multi-fuel stove. That's right. what you um, or whatever your flavor is, ISIS, when they come, you want multi-fuel stoves because you, <laughs> you can make them run off anything. Um, but again, there's downsides. They're a little messy, they're a little heavy, and they're a little bulky. Um, they also can burn your eyebrows off when you're not paying attention and they're heating up, which has happened to all of my friends, including myself, if you're not paying attention because you can have kind of a fire bomb. You got to start it up and it pisses uh, fuel all over and it kind of burns and then as it heats up that pisser changes size however it works i'm not a scientist then all of a sudden you have your fuel shooting up into this little plate and it kind of bounces off and then that's your heat source to to heat the stove that's a horrible way of explaining it but it does take a minute for it to prep and get heated up i especially like the the technical term pisser how about, yeah. you know, maybe <laughs> nozzle or, you know, like... Nozzle uh, wouldn't work. Jet. How's jet. That? There jet. we go. Jet. Jet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... Man, I... I uh, probably from my father, always used anything that, you know, water, 
fuel anything came through was mm -hmm. a fisser. Okay. For whatever reason, it's stuck, right? One of the I many like it. That, I mean, it, it makes sense. I knew what you were talking about right away. Yeah, and that's. I mean, as far as male female, it works the same. So I can't get yelled at for being one sided on the male female thing. True. So that's a multi fuel stove. Then you have kind of the all in one, like a jet boil, an MSR reactor that has a cup. It has the bowl. It all fits in one little neat little container. It takes an isobutane canister. That canister screws on the stove, and then the, the actual boiling cup portion locks into the burner. I'll go over that in a minute. That's like the all-in-one kit. Then you have the kind of a piece-it-together kit, meaning you buy a, a one of my favorites, um, a Soto Windmaster, which is the stove, and then you buy um, ever new, ever not how you pronounce it, titanium cook set. You come up with your own special brand of coolness, and that's your your system. So you kind of bracket it out. Then you have the the tablet stoves, which takes forever, like the second coming to boil water. It takes forever, like fifteen minutes, and it smells like fish if you use the esbit. It's this little white chunk with fish oil in it. Your pot smells like fish, your tent, you light it on fire, you put a cup over there, and you wait till the next day for your water to boil. A lot of times if it's windy, you're putting two fishy tablets under there. But that's like a tablet type stove. And then you have the the white gas, or the, excuse me, the uh, alcohol stoves. You can make them out of beer cans, um, super lightweight. You build, you take a little fuel bottle. A lot of guys will use like the um, high density polyethylene, obviously, this would make a lot of fires. They're these little um, containers. I can't think of anything else to call it with a pisser. It's basically a little squeeze bottle with uh, alcohol right. in yeah. it. You like that? Again, 15 minutes later, maybe the next day, your your thing is <laughs> boiling at the top of it. I have had very bad luck with alcohol stoves. Um, um, what's in that bottle? So this is... Everybody asks me that. I'll just go over my little special brimity, my little own brew. So for that size of bottle, one and a half scoops of Enduro uh, from Mountain Ops, who is a sponsor of the Gritty Bowman. And then this is raspberry lemonade drink mix from King Supers, which is not a sponsor of the Gritty Bowman. <laughs> um, this is just a flavored drink mix with a little bit of electrolytes in it. And then uh, I put Enduro in it, and that's why I have to pee all the time because I drink that too much. <laughs> so, I'm just curious. It's uh, awful pink and large, and that's a big bottle. Yeah, I drink too much water if there is such a thing. I have to pee already. We just started the podcast. So the white – then you, the alcohol stoves is – that's kind of the basic. There's all kinds of variations of those different – Now, I've talked – you talk to a lot of guys that go super ultra light. And, yeah. you know, they're, that's, they, I mean, they really, they want to walk into the, the woods with a five day camp that weighs 10 pounds. Like you say all the time, somebody has to get paid. I mean, somebody gets paid. Like you, you might go in light, but you're going to pay on the back end uh, in terms of comfort, maybe. Potentially you could. Yeah. And so when you're talking about an alcohol stove, that seems to be the go-to for the ultra light backpacker. For, for some of them. And, you know, these are these are my opinions, right? These are what the collective of all the things I've done in the past. I have not had great luck with alcohol stoves. Now, why? Uh, well, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> two epic disasters. Um, <laughs> you do with an alcohol stove, you have, it's more compact, it's lighter weight. Those are the two big bonuses. They're not overly durable, although you can kind of bend them and, you know, they're, you're pretty simple. There's not a lot to go wrong. There's no parts and pieces to speak of. Mm -hmm. But if you, uh, and this can happen with even a canister stove, if you, the fuel, right? If um, you run out of fuel uh, or it takes, if, if the conditions um, dictate to t pour more alcohol than you would think um, you would need, mm -hmm. you'll run out of fuel quicker. The bottle can also leak. Um especially if you have the little plastic fuel bottles and they take forever to, to boil water. Um, you can't, for example, boil snow. So I'm assuming most ultralight backpackers never hit 
you know, the proverbial, you know, the, the what if, the um, what do you want to call it, uh, you know, mother nature type of a problem, right? Like, I guess. They never hit like, catastrophes yeah. or. Yeah. I mean, when you have no water and you have snow, I can tell you right now, it's going to take every bit of alcohol you have to boil snow. Because not only are you having to melt the snow, now you have to boil the water potentially, mm -hmm. or you put drops in it, but it takes quite a bit. Now, if you're just an in and out guy and you're going ultralight and there's no danger of any of that, uh, needing to boil snow, for example, it's not a, not a big problem. I just have been stuck in a lot of last year was like an epic boil snow, no water year. We just always seem to be always away from water when we, when we needed it. And we had to boil snow a lot, especially spring scouting. Um, you'll run into no water and lots of snow and then I have alcohol and then I go, I get to lick top ramen and stick it in uh, the seasoning because I have no more fuel to boil. So potential problems with alcohol stoves, that's a couple of them. Fuel leaking, they take forever to boil. They do not work well in high wind, even if you put a windscreen around them. They'll work. I mean, I, I know we're going to get guys, I have an alcohol stove and it works great. I believe you. It just doesn't work as well as some other options if you use one. The Esbit stove, I'll just start. I don't have an alcohol stove because I, I hate them so much I don't even use them anymore, so I need to have one at the house. But I have some other ones. Um, so this here, let me get this out. So this is the little fishy container thing or official uh, little pill uh, tablet dealio from Esbit. And believe it or not, this is it, right? This is this little box. It's genius. You pop this open. Mm -hmm. You put the little tablet in here. You light it on fire. You put this up here, and you're done. That's it. So this one I've never burnt with the Esbit. You know, you can see, I don't know if you can tell. There's black kind of a – Yeah, yeah. turns everything black, and it smells like crap. Pretty lightweight, very cheap. I don't know what this is for six bucks or something. These tablets aren't very expensive. With this, honestly, I keep this in the car a lot. Um, I'll have one of these with like nine of these tablets, just as a precautionary thing. And I, I like drinking coffee, so if I ever want to stop and make a coffee when I'm driving, I, I have this. Doesn't hurt anything. You these Esbit tablets, same kind of downfalls of the long boil time. This thing is basically indestructible. If I ripped this off, I could just monkey it back on there. Wouldn't be a problem. Um, relatively lightweight. Not a big deal. Very simple. You kind of, it's like, it's like boiling with a candle though, isn't it? Yep. That's a good analogy. It is like, <laughs> like I said, the second coming would be waiting for it. It's a long time. So these can't break you can't lose them or you can't lose you can lose them but they don't break they don't leak the tablets they're yep. very cheap not a big deal and then this is just a primus real lightweight coffee cup thing that i use in fact i didn't clean it the, that's probably got the cure for cancer in there that's <laughs> i had several boils of coffee so then you have and i keep what i do i keep my stoves in like a little ditty bag container and in that, I have the stove, and then I usually keep a flint and steel or a lighter and a spoon. This basically allows me, just keeps me to not forget. So I have these ready to go. And that's in a Kafaru pullout that you got right there? Well, everyone in the world has copied these, so they don't all, they just sell them at Kafaru now. But yes, we were one of the first to ever build them. But uh, it's Dude, a Kafaru pullout. Aaron, it's a bag with a zipper on it. That's <laughs> kind of, but the thing was, it's like, <laughs> I get a kick. It is just a bag with a zipper. Um it just took a long time for people to realize it is just a bag with a zipper. People <laughs> like them. Now everybody's making them. True, true. But you're right. So this is one of my all-time, maybe the all-time favorite for kit stoves. This is an MSR reactor. Mm -hmm. and, and, what, and, and say again what you mean by kit stove. You mean like it's all everything comes together, everything you need to cook. To when, you, when you buy it, you are ready to roll except for fuel and spoon okay so this here we'll just do get it ready to go this is your burner yep. it doesn't shoot flame out this actually just heats up so you screw this all came inside there 
you see so a screw that on. This is your cup. Yep. Bam. That's it. It's ready to go. Okay. And then obviously extremely windproof because this sits on top of the burner. So the, the, the burner's inside, the wind's hitting it. This is blocking it. So this works very well in the wind. This here pops off your lid. And then you've got your handle right here so you don't burn your hand after it's boiled. Pretty simple system, extremely durable. Um, when you compare this to the jet boil, same system. You've got this little plastic cup. Yeah, everybody in the dog has this. Yeah, this is this is the one people care, cater to. You've got this is the flash, maybe. Honest to God, this is my wife. Honestly, what it is I, about jet boils is this suck people in. I don't know, but out of all the ones I told her to get, she came home with this. Is oh look, it's still new. It's two years old. She hasn't used it yet. Um, but there's little indentions on the burner. Uh -huh. This locks in, and then you. Yep. Well, it's supposed to twist, and then this goes on to your your fuel. Right. You got your lid. Yep. That's it. You're ready to go. Now, now, now I've got to admit, you know, the jet boil is kind of the go-to. Most people yep. love them. It's like super easy to use. You can grab that thing with your bare hand after it's boiling and dump it into, you know, your food. It has a little thing on there that when the thing heats up, it says, "Oh, it's boiling." Little, <laughs> a little, a little color dial that that says, "Yep, it's finished." Um, you know, the thing screws on to the pot. I mean, it's, so it won't fall off. You know, it's got a lot of these, like, it's a genius kind of design. Right. So well, they, they weren't, they didn't, aren't the ones that originated it. They just marketed it better, <laughs> which I don't care about that portion of it. But, you know, my question is, um, we talked about this before we started the show. The, uh, it's not your favorite one. No, no. Well... The one thing with, with this, which is um, more of um, a user-friendly, where the nipple locks in. I said nipple. Where the nipple locks into the actual yep. uh, you know, cup. That I don't like. It's not overly smooth um, yeah. compared to when you look at the reactor. It just sets on top and you just pop it off. Mm -hmm. So you don't burn your hand with that either and you don't have to worry about – unlocking this yep. it just pops off yep so i do like that but no with the the jet boil um i just had too many bad experiences i had a i was just like everyone else a jet boil is what i i mean i used a bunch of stoves but the jet boil i liked it was just everything you said it was foolproof and i had the sol tie and i melted the bottom off of it um the uh heat um what do they call that? Heat transfer, little wavy things at the bottom. Yep. Mm -hmm. They melted off, fell into the burner. The stove didn't work. I had six days left of my hunt. I will say it did that because I was not using it correctly, fully admitting I had to boil snow in it because it. you want to live. We yeah. needed water. You just had to take one for the team, and the stove went down. Did not call Jet Boil about it. I knew it was my own fault. Um, so went back. I so how are you using it wrong? Well, you can't boil snow in one of these. Why not? Because they won't warranty it when the bottom falls off. Now, let me finish. Hold on. <laughs> That's in the titanium version. You, the, the titanium version, which they quit making. So I went and got another titanium version. And I guess you can't cook top ramen in those either. Because the bottom falls off. You can only boil water in the SOL tie. And the SOL, I thought, was fitting because it left me shit out of luck twice in two different weeks, <laughs> SOL. So, and it's funny, what also matches SOL is their warranty. They basically said, you are SOL, buddy. You can have a 10% off coupon and buy a third, which things happen. Not a big deal. So I'm like. The snitter's not happy. Oh, I, I'm like, because I've, you know, stuff happens. At, things happen, right? I'm like, okay, I'm going to give it one more shot. I'll just get the standard SOL, right? And this is pretty hardcore use, okay? You know what I mean? Like we're, you know how much I'm in the field. 
So we head in again, right? And my buddy's falls. Okay, it falls down. It's not worth $2 at the bottom of the hill. So we climb back up and we go ahead and reenact that with my reactor, except I throw mine down the hill to prove a point. No problems with the reactor. Still work. In fact, Frank's got it now. Uh, he inherited it. A little dinged up, but it works. So uh, uh, his stove is now down. It's, it's in the stove mountain wilderness graveyard. So we get to a point three days or four days later, I've got to boil snow again. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm pouring the co- I mean, we're going full rip. I'm pouring the co- coals to it, just getting water because we don't have any. Well, you can melt the bottom off a standard one as well. So now I haven't broke any rules. I haven't done anything wrong. I call Jet Boil. Like, hey, look, it melted off the other one too. And they were like, oh, yeah, we don't warranty that. I'm like, you don't warranty it. I didn't do anything wrong. I just got it. Luckily with the REI, you can just take it back. And it, during all of this time, I have reactor too. And, but the reactor was three ounces heavier. God forbid I pack an extra three ounces for something that never breaks, ever, right? It never breaks. So people have brought up, it has an igniter. Yeah, it does. It works about 10% of the time. Um, You can go and try an igniter at any REI. Just keep trying them. Guaranteed, not all of them are going to work on a jet boil. Some of them work great. But what all of that, I was willing to forgive. I never mentioned anything to anyone But then I did an article on hunter-friendly companies. And let me tell you what, Jetboil is not hunter-friendly. They'll take your money, but they are not hunter-friendly at all. And that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Because my reactors, they're infallible, basically. They can't break. There's nothing they they can't happen. So with MSR, they're not pro-hunting. They're not anti-hunting. But when you talk to them, if you ever call, a lot of their people are there hunting at MSR. They're hunters where not so much at um a jet boil now before i sound like i only use these two stoves i also which i've lent my buddies to test out primuses i have a very good relationship with primus they are very pro hunting they make a version of a jet boil and, and primus is one of the companies that started it all like 50 60 years ago um they make the Omni Night Light Tie multi fuel stove that that I prefer for a multi fuel stove. Uh, they make that like an Eta Solo, a Spider. They make a ton of different stoves that are all great. So my suggestion would be don't support anti hunting, buy a Primus or an MSR, and if the bottom of this ring falls out in an emergency situation, we were pushing it to the limit. We were just pouring snow over and over, but I've done it with my primuses and MSRs and I've never had anything fall off. Right now, the next thing to get to about these kit stoves, you cannot, well, you, you can get an adapter to boil, use other pots than the cup it comes with. Um, you know, it sets on top of the, the burner, a little thingy dingy that that's very technical too. thingy dingy sits on top and you can boil it, use a different cup, but, um, that, that can also be an issue with the kit stoves. Uh, I, again, I'm sure everyone's jet boils have worked great, and uh, but my experiences with them have warped my fragile little mind, and that it, it just drives me crazy that they're anti-hunting. The thing fell apart several times, and they really were not willing to do anything to help me out. So I like Simple, and I bought a Pocket Rocket like – when did they come out oh man 15 years ago or something long time 10 years ago i think 2000 or 1990 anyway i bought one then and i used it for about 10 years i think um i think it's 15 years ago they they came out but that little pocket rocket still is produced today Oh, I mean, yeah, that thing uh, it stood the test of time. <clears throat> and, you know, it's simple. It just screws onto your pot, your gas, and uh, I just have a little titanium cook pot. And uh, I've been using that for years. And <clears throat> all my buddies, you know, I've got jet boils pretty much. And uh, there's something about the pocket rocket that I like. 
that I just I haven't. know what it is. Is Cameron Haynes used one and you copied him because that's why everybody has a pocket rocket. Well, Tell me that I'm not lying. <laughs> there was that, you know. Yeah. Cameron okay. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But, but I I just couldn't. I'm at heart. I'm a pretty frugal guy. And so it's like 39 bucks. I know it's cheap. It's so cheap. And then it never broke. It just keeps working. So I'm like, I could go buy the new fancy whiz bang pot stove combo, but I already have this one that just has never failed me. And, and although it leaks lots of heat and stuff because it's just when the wind blows or whatever that gets yeah, 19 inches above the burner yeah that's the downside to it <laughs> but that is what's awesome because it's like you have your own jet engine there <laughs> you, crank that, you crank that thing up and it's like and you're just a feeling of power that comes with that stove yeah just a little pocket rocket i mean it's so true so it's not very efficient it's not very efficient so um i pack a little extra fuel probably uh given the fact that it burns so inefficiently so that was the next thing i was going to ask you though was okay well what are your feelings on the pocket rocket since i hold it so dearly (laughs) no it's i mean if you're poor buy a pocket rocket because it'll last forever and yeah, you know, they don't break. I haven't heard, but maybe two of them breaking. Um, a pocket rocket's a good option. Mine broke. I mean, after years and years of using it, uh, season after season, beating the crud out of it, it finally just kind of only let flame out one side. I think it like burned out or rusted through. But <clears throat> I just called them up and said, "Hey, um, my pocket rocket isn't working." And they said, "Oh, what's your address?" And they sent me a new one. Yeah, they're very good. Um, about, I hate to say this, but I they warranted a stove that I lost, and they still gave me a new one. I mean, they knew me, I would guess. I don't know. But, but I mean, they... Dude, I oh, used this thing for like 10 years. That's, that's what I, I mean. You I spent 40 bucks on it. I think it was 30 at the time. I kind of felt like I should probably just throw them a bone and buy them a new one. Oh, I know. Well, MSR and, uh, and, and Primus both are great to... Uh, to deal with, um, be, I mean, like with mine, I sent them photos of this epic trip and the, in, in the case of the MSR, you know, in the background, I'm like, dude, I went, uh, I lost it. You know, I told a story and I'm like, I just, if you I get a brother deal, that would be super cool. Just a discount on another one. Cause the, the reactors are like 180 bucks and, uh, and one showed up in the mail. It just said, thanks for the photos and supporting MSR. And, um, but I tell you what, take a jet boil, burn that thing to death three times. They're going to tell you to pound sand is what I found. But so <laughs> kit stoves are um, a very viable option. They're simple, right? They're very good. Go ahead. Um, we talked about this once before, uh, though. Most kit stoves, t- correct me if I'm wrong, they're, they're butane, right? We're all Pretty much all kit stoves are isobutane. There's not really... I mean, you get a kit with a when, – when I say kit, for simplification purposes, the burner and the um, pot. pot coincide or work together with each other. They, they pretty much all take isobutane. Um, so then you have um, – this is basically my homemade Aaron Snyder kit stove. I cannot take credit for this system. Uh, I stole this from um, Colton Conrad. Uh which I actually didn't remember until I said, hey, you guys, look at this system. And Colton's like, yeah, I showed you that last year. And then the bell kind of rung and I remembered. I was all excited about it at first. but I'm uh, a genius. Oh, yeah. Cool. Exactly. So I've got – the reason why I like this weight comparable to everything else, I've got two titanium pots. Mm-hmm. This one's obviously cooking ramen, whatever. This is my coffee pot. They fit inside of each other. These are – I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's ever new. So you've got those. Then I have this stove. I think it's two ounces. And this is um, this is a Soto Windmaster. And this has pros and cons. So here's your burner. And the option, this is the undo. So it comes off and then this snaps together. 
So you can lose this. I actually have an extra one of these wired to this bag because it weighs nothing. Um, and then you pop that off and drop it. You pop that off and then it clips together. There's a little clip right there. So that's flat, so it's very compact. That fits inside. And then I have, when I'm burning like big stuff, you can snap this big four prong jobby okay. on there for burning bigger pots. I don't usually carry all this, but just as an example. And then I have a lighter in my backup spoon. This is the only good thing that actually came from my jet boil. No, this is from GSI. This is just a, a flighty I've, spoon. I've got that. I hardly ever use it because it drives me crazy, but it is good for a backup. All that fits in there, and if I wanted to, I could actually fit the fuel canister in there, but I don't mess around with it. So all of this combined, you know, total both pots and everything is 11 ounces, which is equivalent to the lightest weight jet boil, for example. But the beauty of this is I'm not mixing church and state. I can cook my coffee away from my noodles, so my coffee doesn't take my noodles, and the noodle doesn't taste like coffee. So I've got my little coffee cup completely separate and then my cooking thing separate. Now, 11 ounces to an ultra lightweight weenie guy that's running an alcohol stove is, is heavy. But for me, you know, I drink, I make the chaffee thing in the morning. I take two Starbucks Colombians, pour them in there, two hot chocolates, pour them in. And I want to snap up when I wake up. So I use like this huge concoction. Um, and this allows me to do it and not uh, make my noodle. <laughs> It's not that funny. Make my noodles um, taste like coffee. Yes. And then if I go ultra light, I also have an even lighter weight ever new um, pot. But all that fits together in one little happy package. What's that pot made out of? Titanium. Um, okay. It's a titanium ever new ultra light. This is the, I don't know, is this the 800? I can't. It's a it's a kit that you buy. One of them's like seven or four hundred milliliters or whatever it is, and the other one. Anyway, they come together. And the stove was the uh, M or the uh, Soto Windmaster. So how does it handle? It looks a lot like you know just a regular pocket rocket. So how does it burn fuel without so the baffles and the micro regulator? Um, is what they call it, which is supposed to work better at elevation and be more efficient. It is very efficient. Um, so when you look at efficiency, um, well, let's go into that in a minute. We'll talk about efficiency and how you can, there's different ways to look at efficiency, straight boil time, how long it burns, you know, the one canister, whatever else. Um, after that, you have, oh, a good example, um, one more stove. This is just what I had at my house. This is the new version of the reactor. It's actually a little heavier. This is the, it was it was the MSR wind boiler, but then Jetboil sued MSR for having boiler in it. So now it's called the wind burner. I don't know. It happens, right? But wow. this has a cup on the bottom. And then you can simmer with this one. It's just not like on or off. Wow. That fits there. Looks like a Jetboil to me. Pretty much. Um, and then you've got your canister. So this, the only, the biggest, like they made this, I'm sure, because of jet boil. Totally. To compete um, and it would be stupid not to. And because the reactor, I don't know what was out first, the reactor, the 1.7, the big reactor or the jet boil. But trying to keep up, right, this thing locks into these. So what they did is they... It, it fits better than a jet boil. So they they probably just took what people didn't like about jet boil. Um, so does it weigh a little more than the jet boil? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, well, lightest jet boil to this is a four-ounce difference. But with, um, but so, with the similar – with the same size can uh, and everything? I think it's two ounces difference, one ounce different um, okay. comparison. Pretty close. This does have a, a happy little uh, cup. So does this make you happy, Aaron, or or is that does that kit kind of not float your boat? So, well, yeah, no, it doesn't. Um, in fact, I'm giving this to my buddy Nick. Um, 
So for me, we'll go over efficiency, what might float someone's boat over something else. The re uh, the, when I take the reactor, right, I just want to straight boil water, um, and that's it. I hardly ever cook on uh, one of these stoves. Mm -hmm. And when I do, I bring a multi-fuel because we're camping by the car. So for me, straight up boil water or snow. I take the reactor as a very good option for that. Um, I don't use the reactor as much now as I used to just because of the, the kit that I made is about as good as I can get. Um, so let's talk or about the, the kit that Colton made. But, but can, I know. go on, go on. I know. I, it was so funny, too, because I'm like, dude, look at this. And there was a couple a-holes that flew out. He's like, because I'm usually the guy that comes up with cool stuff. So when it's someone else, it's definitely noted who came up <laughs> with the cool kit, right? Um, so he was like, dude, I came up with That's the one I showed you last year, remember? And I'm like thinking, I'm like, you know what? I obviously was not paying that much of attention, but I do remember the ever new. And I'm like, yeah, that, yeah, that's, he's right. He does research. So if you like drink, um, you know, coffee or whatever, a reactor or a jet boil, if, unless you bring that little plastic cup can be a problem because everything ends up, you got to clean it all the time. Everything tastes the same. I don't clean mine. I don't mind like, you know, noodles sticking to the side and eating them again later or whatever when I yeah. cook my ramen. But let's, let's talk about efficiency. Um, there's different ways to look at things. You know, when you, when you look at the efficiency of a stove, one, straight boil time, right? What boils water the fastest out of all the different options? Then you have what burns fuel for the longest um, amount of time, meaning does it stay on for an hour and 45 minutes, two hours? You know, how long does that one little canister burn for? And then you have the, uh, whoops, then you have the what burns best in the wind. Okay, so if you – see, it all goes in there. If you are going to be exposed, you know what I mean? You're going to be boiling in the wind. A reactor is probably a better option even than that. The Windmaster does work um, really well but not nearly as well as like a reactor um, or some of the Primus options as well. Uh, really like if you – not to be a total geek, I go home, we set these all on my counter, and we just boil them to test them, meaning the very secure, very happy, very non-wind environment at 6,800 feet. Mm -hmm. We just boil water, and we, okay, that took a minute and 28 seconds. We figure out which one boils the best. Then we crank them all on, light them up, and we see how long they all burn for with one canister. Then in the mountains at high elevation, we don't burn the whole canisters at high elevation because we don't have that much time or we have ADD. We check the boil times at 12,000 feet. All of those things work or coincide with hunting. And then obviously we check, okay, how long, um, how much length of time per boil is added in a windy environment? Do I have to add the weight of a windscreen to make this stove as efficient as it used to be. And what is the weight of that windscreen now compared to the weight of, you know, windscreen, that stove all combined? How much weight did that add? Is it easier to just not mess with a windscreen and grab a different stove option? Having said all this, we're not saving babies and, and sending rockets to the moon. You're just boiling water. It's not that big of a deal. But um, for me right now, um, one of the best systems that I've used is, well, the two, my, my three favorites for a kit stove, the MSR reactor um, for my own personal kit that I've made up is that ever new Soto Windmaster and a Primus Omni Light tie for a multi fuel. After that, though, they do just boil water. It's not that big of a deal. At elevation, I've heard that the isobutane can be a problem. Is that, is that accurate or with t certain temperatures? Oh yeah, it could, temperatures for sure. Um, I'd say you're looking at a solid thirty to forty-five seconds in your boil time at high altitude on an isobutane. Uh, cold weather, the isobutane will freeze. You can keep it in your uh, sleeping bag and keep mm -hmm. it to warm it up or keep it warm, which significantly helps. Um, you know, 
the longevity or whatever of the canister. Cold weather, like how cold? Oh, anything below 30, it definitely starts to go downhill. Anything at freezing is because the, the particles or components or whatever in the isobutane. I can't remember. There's one portion of this because it's... Is that uh, is that then where you would use a multi-fuel stove if it's going to be negative or below zero or something like that? or That would also be handy. Under, under yes. 30 degrees or... Or be, your, really below. I with I'd still use an isobutane at thirty, but when you get down in the single digits, um, high high elevation, an isobutane stove is definitely worthwhile. But there's people that climb high high peaks and use reactors and jet boils um, and don't have any major issues. You just lose efficiency. Is the you know the biggest problem is efficiency. Now, if you camp in extreme cold weather or you you are at extreme high altitude on a lot of your hunts. You may want to worry about some of these things, but if you're, you know, below 12,000 feet and hunting above 20 degrees, it's not that big of a deal, in my opinion, to to worry about. I mean, in the morning, I shake up the canister, I'll throw it in my sleeping bag, warm it up a little bit, and then I'll, I'll boil my coffee or I'll just keep it in my sleeping bag overnight if it's real cold. Um, but I don't, I always get bashed when I talk about jet boils. They're Jet boils work great. Lots of people use them. But for extreme conditions, you compare a reactor to a jet boil, there is no comparison. The reactor, and that's not a biased opinion. I mean, that's the truth. A reactor is a more durable, bomb-proof system compared to a jet boil. There's no igniter, for one. There's the the way that the uh, burner burns, basically. There's no heat lost. It's not shooting fire out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, obviously, it's just a more durable system. So what's your favorite way to <clears throat> light the stove? I use a flint and steel a lot. I just striker. Really? Yeah. Which one? I actually have it here. <laughs> um, it was in one of these bags. Uh, I usually keep one in each bag. My buddy robbed me the other day. It's a pretty simple, it's a really small one, and I, I keep a couple of them on me pretty much at all times. <laughs> when I'm in the woods. <clears throat> but not necessarily when you go to the movie theater? No, I don't wear one around my neck like some dudes, <laughs> although I've seen that. So that's it. Um, this is a light my fire, and you literally just... Whoa. Whoa. It may have hurt just, my Mac. Let me scoot back a little. Let your computer on go. fire. Um, but that just starts it up. Dang, so. that's a that's a lot of that's a serious flint and steel right there. So I think you know that we talk about the art of survival, right? Not too many people use these, right? But right. they always work. You can't. It, it doesn't not work. So am I going to start? Is it as good as a lighter? Not in good condition. No, hell no. I just you just with a lighter you just light it. But um, this is definitely something that always works, no matter what. Um, no matter how wet it gets, it's still gonna it's still gonna work, right? And and you can do uh, a couple different it variations. Can't run out of fuel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I always um, I have a lighter weight version. It's a, like almost like a pin. What's that one called? This is a light my fire. Light my fire. And where can people get those? Almost anywhere. <laughs> Walmart, I think, sells them. There's a there's one by Gerber I think that's like a Bear Grylls one and there's another one that's more of a necklace it's it, it's literally um like like that big mm -hmm. um and you it it it, it it's apart. super simple it it literally you just <laughs> undo it off your neck and you can strike it like that or you can you know pop it off but it's super lightweight it's like I don't know an ounce or something so I always have one of those. <laughs> Um, so, uh, is that pretty much how you light the stove then? Yeah. Most, most of the time. So, uh, every, every time, I mean, <laughs> I always use it. Is, is that how you light your trioxane? Yeah. Yep. It's an, it, dude, I don't know, but it's just pretty cool to see fire like that. <laughs> well, now I want one. It's, uh, I mean, I thing, have a flint and steel, but I have like this old giant rock with this little piece of metal. And I think I get like two sparks coming off of it. Well, they have the old square ones where you have the magnesium where you can shave it off, yeah. Uh, which is better for building a fire. I don't bring one of those all the time because I have 
trioxane, basically. I mean, yeah. I'm, yes, I'm about survival, but I'm not like, you know, going out living naked or whatever, right? I mean, I have some common sense too. So the. You can find some Tinder. Yeah, I'll find something. It'll be in my backpack, probably covered in Vaseline or something or trioxane. But with, um, with this, like for starting trioxane, it may not light on your first strike, right? Or if your first try. And, and it's great to have a big lighter. Usually for me, what I suggest with guys is a lightweight version of one of these is like an ounce, um, then a lighter, and then obviously some of those long burn survival matches. To just have in your kit, it doesn't weigh a whole lot. Um, it's pretty much what I bring, but <clears throat> what is your favorite lighter? I just get a Bic lighter from, I don't get just a cheap plastic light. Bic lighter. Yeah, we, I buy like a bunch of them at the beginning of the year and there's a little, the empty container is the garbage and the full container there. And every time I'm getting my stuff ready, I'll reload my, my pullouts with new lighters if I need to. So I, I basically it's a, it helps me remember to, to, to have them. So you don't have like... <clears throat> You know, some sort of status symbol lighter, man lighter that's like Zippo with like an elk on the front of it or anything like that that you refill no. and that's like part of your being? No. No? No, it's not. Yeah. No, I just, whatever. My image is shattered of you. I know, right? Well, so I used to get the super cool isobutane, uh, you know, whatever, or not isobutane, uh, propane, you know, you fill up lighters or whatever. Yeah, yeah, the little torches. They don't work past 10 feet. 10,000 feet worth of crap. So I just never, I quit Plus, trying. They use. could fail. Yeah, they can. And I think the more and more crappy situations I'm in, you know, like we say many times, the collective of all the things you've screwed up on, you remember certain things. Like you remember when your Bic lighter gets a little wet. Mm -hmm. And Bics work all the time. I always suggest everyone to always bring one. But uh, a striker, it never fails. Um, and literally you saw it. I mean, I didn't even really get after it, but it, it like, you can really, you know, get some spark going. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone should bring one. A lot of people don't, a lot of guys have them and don't even know how to use them. Um, but it, it is a pretty effective cool. way to get stuff going. Okay. Okay. Light my fire. Yep. But I just Google Flint and steel. Yeah. You'll get to, pick a blast through a whole bunch of them this these here i i think rei um they had them and i think i bought six at one time or eight of them they weren't very expensive mm -hmm. and i put them like you know in my different pullouts or whatever and i have one in my little survival pack and i don't i don't bring much for survival stuff you know like i have like eight long burn matches i have this and i have my it's not like i have this huge death zombie killing bug out bag kit it's just this is one of the more important things I have just because it always works. Yeah, yeah. Well, Aaron, um, I think we need, to, we need to do the food one on a different show. Okay, yeah, this is pretty long. We kind of ran out of time. It happens. Yeah, but, but uh, that will give us a little more time to prepare. In the meantime, people who want to get a good podcast um, on backcountry food, there's a few of them out there. Uh, Christy Titus was on the Full Draw Full Time podcast with South Cox and Cody Kellum. And on that podcast, she, she talked about backcountry food and nutrition. Um, and on the Hunt Backcountry podcast, I'm pretty sure, I think they had Heather's Choice on there, and they talked about backcountry food and, like, high-quality foods. and Heather's Choice, she's out of Alaska, right? Um, I, I don't know, dude. I think I think she is. I think she, she is the super healthy, mm -hmm. super expensive backcountry food, but it is it's dehydrated, not freeze dried. But you know, I think you know a mountain house costs you like eight bucks. Yeah, and I think hers are like twelve. Yeah, twelve to fifteen. I ordered some and tried them out. And I make my own. Yeah, yeah. that's now, what I was gonna say. Is last I'm not year trying to take business away from Heather, <laughs> but a dehydrator is fifty bucks. Yeah. Do the math. Make your own dehydrated food. Yeah. Dehydrator is different than a freeze dried. But but uh, if you're making it before the season, really the difference is is dehydrated doesn't just doesn't keep as long as freeze dried. Yep, exactly. You know? And hers is dehydrated. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like 
if if you don't have time, definitely order her stuff. But we'll go into it in the other podcast. But definitely, I don't think people realize you buy a dehydrator and throw a stew in there. You now have dehydrated food. Well, not only that, and we talked about that, like I said, in episode 11 of Gritty Bowman, so folks can go and check that out. But you know what else? My sister made uh, our backcountry meals this last year, and uh, she just ordered all the individual components, like freeze dried, already freeze dried. Like, I yeah. got some chicken, I got some, you know, some, some peas, and I got some whatever, you know. Uh, potatoes and freeze dried eggs, and you know, put them all into their own batches and bags and seasoning. And we had like uh, Thai peanut, which was one of my favorite ones, and uh, what else? Like a curry thing. And anyway, they were they were way better than the Mountain House, tastier and just good for you. There's no crap in them. Um, but she did order. She ran out of chicken. So she ordered chicken straight from Mountain House because her source had run out of chicken. And in a hurry, she put all the seasonings and everything in the same bag with the Mountain House freeze-dried chicken, just like she did with the other chicken she had. And then Travis and I got on the mountain, added a little water to it, went to eat our food, and it tasted like a bucket of salt had been dumped in there. Yeah. Because the chicken from Mountain House wasn't just freeze-dried freeze-dried chicken it was freeze-dried chicken with mountains of salt on it and the food the meal she had prepared already had a dose of salt in it the right amount of salt that we wanted but then you had the chicken that has all that salt and it was just like it just tasted like salt well it's like 1700 percent of your daily sodium intake yep usually it's a lot (laughs) lots, lots to talk about there lots of ideas i've tried to get my sister to come on the show and uh provide her recipes and talk about it because she's she'd be a great great guest but like i said you can check out hunt back country podcast full draw full time they got some good stuff i'm sure there's some other ones out there but uh i'm gonna try some of that heather's choice as well was it tasty yeah oh yeah it's pretty good um you know when you when you start diving into like the food thing um which we'll talk about in the podcast but you know, you got to pick the lesser two evils, health, taste, you know, nutritional value. What's going to be, you know, can you handle a crappy tasting dinner or can you handle a crappy tasting lunch? Like there's a lot to go into and you brought it up earlier. I know what I want to eat. I know what I like to eat. I put that in my backpack. Yeah, it is pretty much that simple. It's kind of <laughs> that similar. We're talking about this before and I'm like, well, I know what I like to eat. And so I pack that. Well, I like chocolate chips and I like um, yeah. almonds and I like granola. So that's my breakfast. And right. I put protein powder in that. And I know for I know I like top ramen and I like tuna. So I eat olive oil and top ramen for dinner. And I like bacon and peanut butter and bagels. I eat that for lunch. I don't put a lot of. We're kind of. Not, you're kind of repeating everything I'm going to say too. Yeah. I'm, well. Yeah. Exactly. It's. Um, I can't repeat what you're going to say if you haven't said it. That makes no <laughs> sense. Come on. Um, you're going to be repeating what I said. I beat you to it, but you're right though. And, and as far as weight, as long as you're making that hundred calorie per ounce kind of platform. Yeah. After that, it really doesn't matter what it weighs as long as you're over a hundred calories per ounce. Well, and I've got a, a podcast plan with, uh, Alan Bolin, um, Mm -hmm. with Bolin Lewis outfitters. They were on the show back at, uh, a few months, uh, a few weeks, maybe a month ago. Those guys, uh, Alan is uh, ketogenic, so he's he's keto adapted, mostly burns fat and protein. You know, he's just kind of a, runs like no carbs. And, and they talked about how lightweight their food is for a 10-day hunt, and it's almost always nothing because the calories per, per pound uh, for fat is... is you know, nutritional, uh, yeah, is way higher than carbohydrate. Yeah, if you want to add a caloric intake, pour olive oil in something; it shoots right through the roof. Right, right, exactly. So, and then that, the weight of that is is you know, it's minimal. So he's keto adapted. We're going to do a podcast on that and talk about. It. He's been doing that for quite a while, I guess. Um, and uh, you know, he's fit, strong, in good shape, and. 
but it certainly does. He's got a great haircut, dude. If you can, yeah, he does. Like he's him and uh, Donnie Vincent are both going for that uh, mm-hmm. full skullet kind of an Amish look. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, off though, my head's too fat, man. I can't do the beanie with long hair thing. Those guys can do it. I look like an idiot. But. <laughs> Your hair's kind of thick, like like afro ish. It doesn't like, grow out and down. That's for damn sure. It's wavy as hell. I, it's Norwegian thick hair. <laughs> uh, so was my wife's when she had chemo, and she was deep into it. She lost fifty percent of her hair, but fifty yeah. percent stayed. Uh, most people go completely bald. And, right and uh she she they're like i think three percent they said on her chemo treatment <clears throat> keep their hair so she fell into that category but she's got that uh thick norwegian kind of scandinavian yeah. but it's 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 wire thick but all the new chemo hair is growing in underneath the normal hair and it's like there's all this little poodle hair <clears throat> underneath the 50 percent that stayed yeah so now yeah. it just sort of <laughs> Just frizzy. Kind of frizzy all the time. Yeah. Oh, hey, I can, yeah. At least she has hair. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> well, and in my case, I don't know that I'll ever lose my hair because nobody in my family loses their hair. Dude. Well, my uncle with a full on afro. <laughs> I don't know if he listens. My mom said everybody listens to the podcast. I'm talking like, you remember Fletch, Chevy Chase? <laughs> yeah. And he's playing basketball and they're like, 6'6", six, six, or wait, 6'2", six, 6'6", six, six with the afro. Look at him fight off those defenders and he's got this huge pro. That's my uncle. I'm huge pro. Now he's bald as crap. He looks like kind of a clown thing, you know what I mean? He's no hair here. Most everyone else has all their hair in my family at 90 years old, but my uncle, he lost it in the middle. Let me ask you this. Uh, you were bald for a while. Like, you know, you had it shaved down to the like, the skin. Yeah, 20 years probably, yeah. Yeah. So my question is, now that you got some hair on your head, do you miss being bald? It's simpler. I mean, it's, it's, it's very efficient. You wake up, you shave your head, that's it. Two days later, you shave it again. You know, when you, yeah. it adds five minutes to your shower. Now I got to go see some dude. Most of the hairdressers... It, I, you I know, see you I'm checking your hair homophobic. now and there. <laughs> Oh, Lord, man. And, and, and a lot of them are, are swinging for the home team, right? So I, it's like I got to make sure the right hairdresser lady or dude or whatever is, is there. So, um, yeah, it's been unique. And it's like 20 bucks to cut your hair. Um, <laughs> yeah, dude. This, 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 this bald dome is pretty easy to maintain. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for, for sure. But, I mean, Jody wants me to have hair, so but, I have hair. But what about temper – like – I notice that when I get a little hair, and it really only grows above my ears, but even when I got a little bit around the sides there, it's still warmer. Well, I think if I had hair and shaved it, yeah. I would be like, wow, my head's cold. But since I went so long without hair and then it gradually grew in, it was kind of like an evolution of hair, and I didn't notice. But if I bet if I shaved my head today, I'd be like, wow, my head is cold. <laughs> but I went the other way. Yeah. I, I did a flip-flop. Slowly. I don't know. Maybe it is warmer, but I can't say for sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It makes sense, man. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, uh, thanks for joining us on the Gritty Bone Podcast today. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll hit this uh, food, backcountry food thing again and get into some questions. I'm getting a lot of questions on just general nutrition and health. So read the label. <laughs> If it has lots of sodium, lots of sugar, it's bad. If it has lots of carbs, it's bad. If it's from pretty much any fast food place, it's probably bad. <laughs> and as I always say, if you think you're wrong, you know you're wrong. You probably shouldn't eat it. Bam! Words of wisdom. <laughs> Aaron Snyder. I know, right? <laughs> a- Aaron. Drop the mic. I even have a mic right here to drop, actually. Look at that. Nice. So, all right. I should go, man. Thanks, I appreciate man. it. Thanks, right. everybody, for Stay tuning gritty. in. Okay, Gritty friends, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. If you did, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes, Podbean, or Stitcher. We love reading your reviews. And connect with us on social media if you're on there. Look us up on Facebook and Instagram. And take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can receive notifications when we upload new videos. We've got a sweet deal with Mountain Ops. You get 20% off on all Mountain Ops supplements, combo packs, and apparel when you type in the word gritty at checkout. If you're a hardcore elk hunter or you want to be, 
go to the Elk 101 website online and check them out. Our friend Corey Jacobson is killing it with some of the best elk hunting information and entertainment on the web. If you haven't heard, we're doing a huge gear giveaway to try and grow and expand the Gritty community on Facebook and Instagram. I asked a bunch of friends to pitch in on this gear giveaway, and they all came through with some awesome stuff. Our friends at Kefaru, Rockslide, First Light, Phelps Game Calls, One Shot Gear, Mountain Ops, Triple X Archery, Blacktail Outdoors, and Is It September Yet are pitching in some sweet gear for the giveaway. We'll announce all the details in the next few weeks. All you have to do to be entered to win is like our Gritty Bowman Facebook page and follow us on Instagram. All right, friends, let me leave you with one other quote from Theodore Roosevelt who said, It behooves every man to remember that the work of the critic is of altogether secondary importance and that, in the end, progress is accomplished by the man who does things. We all have a choice. We can be people who do things or people who criticize the work of others. It's pretty simple, really. Get out there and do your thing. Good luck on your hunts and stay gritty. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>